and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Gervis Gregg, Global Public Sector Chief Technology Officer for Chainalysis. Gervis, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting us. So Gervis, you joined Chainalysis after 23 years at the FBI, but you got your Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. How did you make the jump from biochemistry to a career in homeland security? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. In fact, it goes all the way back. I'd always uh, dreamed of being a doctor and had gone to uh, college and was pursuing a degree in chemistry and realized I'd taken so much biology and physiology that I could get a, a biochem degree even sooner. So I pivoted and got my biochem degree, was interviewing with medical schools and realized as much as I love science and medicine, that I just didn't want to be in school for the next 12 years and really wanted to get on out into the workforce. So I made a pivot and became a stock and bond broker. My father and I started our own brokerage business and that was a lot of fun and was doing that for a number of years until one day I, we were at the bank and a good friend of mine was a uh, the bank manager there and he told me uh, about his interest in perhaps joining the FBI. And the more he talked, the more I realized that was the thing that I never knew I always wanted to be. And so I... Um, spoke with my wife and then cold called the bureau uh, about a job. And uh, one thing led to the other. And by the end of that year, I was running through the woods of Quantico and uh, continued to work in the FBI and, you know, use sort of both of that science background, as well as my white collar experience, um, tracing money, working financial crime cases, and then ultimately terrorist financing and, and technology. Wow, that's a very interesting story. Uh, yeah, it was an evolution. A, uh, can you tell us uh, an interesting fact about you that you think not many people may know? Um, well, I'm fluent in Spanish um, uh, and spent some time in Central America when I was um, between my freshman and, and sophomore year. You really learned to love the people there and, and enjoy sort of what is uh, Latin America and, and the language and culture. So I have a great affinity for that. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about your role at Chainalysis right now? Sure. Well, in my role as public sector uh, chief technology officer, my job is to ensure we're building the best tools and gathering the right data for our customers. So my typical day or week is spent talking with um, clients in law enforcement around the world, um, in both in Europe, uh, the Americas, and, and Asia, to make sure that what we're delivering for them is what they need. Uh, and then coordinating with our technology staff and others to make those improvements and product enhancements that will really help them with their operations and better understanding what their mission needs are, are really critical. And that's sort of where I sit in that fusion between technology and operations to make sure that we're supporting our customers in the best possible way. Chainalysis recently released its 2022 crypto crime report. What are some of the findings from that report that you personally found to be most noteworthy or perhaps even alarming? Yeah, well, it, it's there's quite a bit of information in there. And I'd invite any of your listeners to go and, and log on to our website and download it. It's a great read. There's a lot of really interesting and new dynamics that we've added to the report. But I think one of the big takeaways uh, that they will notice right off the bat is that total illicit activity involving crypto increased and it increased dramatically. However, the percentage or share of illicit activity is now at an all-time low. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, while we saw a significant increase in the total dollars associated with illicit activity, because as you know, we map the blockchain and we look for and identify addresses and activity associated with illicit use of crypto. And so as our database and our information grows larger, we're able to associate more and more transactions with illicit activity. And so that number and then the amount of, uh, of activity increased. But when you look at it as a percentage of overall market cap and the size of the market, it actually dropped and it dropped dramatically. We found over $14 billion worth of illicit activity associated with crypto. However, uh, our data, based on what we could see, that represented less than you know, 0.15% of all the transactions that we were able to look at. 
And that's down from 0.62 the year before and 3%, over 3% the year before that. So we've seen this dramatic drop in the overall percentage of illicit activity relative to the size of the growing market. I think that's a positive for consumers because that means that while more people are coming into the space and more dollars are moving into it, the actual share of illicit activity is being uh, diminished. That, that means uh, partners and, and banks, and financial institutions around the world are doing a good job at identifying and, and weeding out or preventing that kind of illicit activity. But make no mistake, $14 billion worth of illicit activity is a huge number and one we should be concerned about. Another uh, positive element that was in the crime report was um, the growing ability of law enforcement to seize illicitly obtained cryptocurrency. You've got a background in national security and law enforcement. Can you talk about how U.S. law enforcement is responding to the rise of crypto crime? I think what you're seeing is a uh, demonstrative increase in the level of crypto literacy and sophistication among these agencies. You know, back in the day when I was working at the Bureau, we used to say, if you really want to make an impact on the crime, you've got to take back the money. In other words, criminals should not be allowed and cannot be allowed to keep the proceeds of their illicit activity. We have to work very, very hard to find that money and get it back to those victims. And I think this past year, you've seen dramatic efforts by the IRS, uh, by the Department of Justice, FBI and other agencies, both in the United States and around the world, who've been focusing on following that money and where possible seizing those funds and returning it back to victims in the tune of billions of dollars in returned assets. That's a significant win. Um, there's still more work to be done, and you're going to see um, additional seizures and efforts both here in the United States and around the world as these agencies increase their ability to utilize this data and follow that money and do it quickly before the criminals have an opportunity to obfuscate or to um, hide those proceeds and making it difficult to find. And also, according to the report, we're seeing ransomware being used now as a geopolitical weapon. We saw this in January when Ukrainian government agencies experienced a ransomware attack by hackers believed to be associated with the Russian government. Do you think ransomware has a growing role in the geopolitical issues of the future? I do. We see very little signs that ransomware is slowing down. In fact, more and more actors are coming into this space. And as you noted, and as identified in our report and even in our mid-year report from last summer, we identified large numbers of these ransomware strains coming out of Russia and out of other Commonwealth independent state associated countries. Um, ransomware is a challenge uh, and it is being used by certain actors as a geopolitical weapon. Um, ransomware uh, is not just a faceless crime and one that uh, is an annoyance. It really is a serious threat to both the national security of, of a country, as well as their economic viability. You know, in today's economy, we depend dramatic, we depend on data. Data is a critical aspect of how we deliver services, how we perform our medical, um, the capabilities of our uh, utility service providers. And when those things are disrupted by a ransomware attack, lives are put at risk, including we saw some prominent attacks in 2020 and 2021 on medical institutions and hospitals. And that's very concerning. So yes, ransomware is a growing challenge. Um, however, one of the interesting things about it is most of the ransomware um, demands are actually to be paid in crypto. And so cryptocurrency or blockchain analytics is actually one of the ways the authorities are going after ransomware because these actors leave these digital breadcrumbs, if you will, as they seek to get paid in crypto. And from that, they're able to map out these networks and identify many of these actors. Uh, in light of the situation going on right now in Ukraine, the United States has imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia. What effect do you think these sanctions will have on crypto activity in Russia? And are there any significant trends you're seeing in that space right now? Yeah, that's an interesting aspect. Um, obviously, sanctions ha have a long and rich history of uh, being utilized to thwart uh, the, asp the actions of, of uh, rogue states as well as aggressor nations. Uh, some of the concerns that are being raised is, well, will we see a pivot shift by some of these actors into crypto as a way to try to evade sanctions? 
And so we've been looking at that really hard. And, and part of our data is able to look at, you know, some of these criminal whales or these organizations that have large wallet holdings or move money in and out of regions of concern. As of right now, we're not seeing any unusual activity in Russia or the Ukraine from a macro level. In other words, looking at transactions on local exchanges in those countries that appear um, to be out of the ordinary. Right now, they appear by and large to be stable. We have seen some additional um, activity in um, in the ruble and currency exchanges. But um, as with tra the traditional financial system, Russia uh, could leverage crypto to evade sanctions, but it would be very difficult for them to do this undetected at scale. And that's the real challenge, right? You can have a slow leak uh, of water and that may not get noticed, but when a whole bathtub floods or a pool drains, everybody notices. And that's the real challenge here for sanctions invasions is to move enough money at a fast enough pace that you can um, do something about it. And um, we're just fortunately at this point, we have not seen that pivot shift into large amounts of activity in Russia and Ukraine with regard to crypto. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with simply because of the transparency of crypto provides. Um, and it gives an opportunity to identify and shut it down uh, should it be detected by the authorities. And stepping back a little bit and looking at kind of the big picture of cryptocurrency, what role do you think crypto plays in the global economy in the future? Well, I think that story is yet to be written. But here are some facts that, that I try to think about when I ponder that question. If you look back in 2019, there was about a trillion dollars exchanged hands globally in crypto. That's a lot of money. But in the context of the larger global economic system, a very small percentage, right? Then in 2020, that number went up to two point, uh, or in 2021, that number, uh, 2020, that number went up to 2.8 trillion. What was it last year in, two, in 2021? It was 15.8 trillion. So we have a trillion in 19. 2.8 trillion in 20 and 15.8 trillion last year. That's a dramatic growth of adoption. Now, granted, there was also some capital appreciation in some of those crypto assets, which helped fund that overall exchange of value. But it's clear that there are now millions and millions and millions of more actors coming into the space, exchanging crypto uh, and using that as a value transfer system. What will we see in the next five years? I think we will look back on these days and say, remember when we thought crypto was a small part of the economy? Uh, we're going to see crypto become a larger and larger part of our global economy. You know, one of the co-founders of our company, Michael Groniger, says that he believes the day will come when all value transfers will be reflected on the blockchain. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of truth to that when we look at how the blockchain can facilitate the speed, secure, and low-cost way of transferring value among individuals. And cryptocurrency is one of those vehicles, as are NFTs and the other. That's very interesting. Well, Gervis, thank you so much again for sharing your insights with us today and for all the work you do at Chainalysis. Well, thank you very much. Look forward to next time. <laughs>